gonna take a really quick moment to quickly make sure I can see everyone's comments. But um, if you guys can see and hear me just fine now, I want to say hi to everyone out there. Um, today's another stream of Astro 101 with myself, Dr. Matthew Richardson, and my co-host Joe Myers. How are things going, Joe? Uh, pretty Gucci. We got them, uh, you know, getting over them storms and today's storm of allergens to kick me in my forehead. But other than that, it's pretty good. I got a pretty fun evening planned, so I'm looking forward to that. All right. First weekend out in about three weeks, thanks to them stinking shingles. Don't get stressed, people. Do not let stress put you in that situation because it's a 10-day cave thing, which was actually kind of cool. Like, I really couldn't deal with other people, which was a plus, but not being able to deal with other people when I wanted to was a minus, uh, and it was 10 straight days of it, so don't do it. Yeah, man, I, I would not definitely want what you had. <laughs> oh. Say no to shingles. All right, guys, well, today we're going to go ahead and kind of pick up where we've left off um, in, in some of the previous streams. So... Of course, we start talking about Earth, its properties. We moved out from Earth and talked about all the other objects around it, the sun and the planets and, and of course, our moon. And so it's only natural to go ahead and move beyond our solar system. And so I've titled today's stream, the topic of today's stream, the Milky Way and, and basically its main sequence stars, but I don't like the title. I thought about it for a little bit and... I really do want to change it because main sequence stars, which we're going to be talking about for today's stream, aren't just you know present within our own galaxy, but they're also present within the galaxies around us. In fact, all galaxies in the universe have main sequence stars. So I'm going to make a quick modification to this title because, as is, it can be a little misleading. So really, we're just talking about main sequence stars here, guys. So Joe. I have this image in the background. What do you think about it? Wait, the, the image in your background? Yes, the image in, in my... Well, the image in the slide. The current slide that's being shown. Can you see slide. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought you were talking about what we were talking <laughs> about while Pamela was talking the image in your background. Uh, but anyway, the, the slide image, yes. Uh, well, that looks like the Milky Way across the sky from a very very high place yes altitude so this image was actually one of the um astronomy astronomy pictures of the day i think it was it was the picture sometime back in february of 2012 i don't remember the exact day but um i mean as you can see as you look up into the night sky and if you're in a, in a location that's relatively um dark doesn't have a lot of light pollution you can get this really nice clean image of our galaxy and of course, looking out into our galaxy, you see all these little dots of light, right? And of course, you see what looks to be about like clouds and stuff as well. Well, today we're going to be focusing on those little dots of light. More specifically, specific types um, or specific types of dots of light that we can see in the night sky. Um, and those dots of light in particular are named the main sequence or the main sequence stars. So, I don't know. I don't know if you've seen an image like this before, Joe. Have you? Oh, for sure. I've taken like ten uh, physics courses through college. It's just the mechanics one, the calculus-based mechanics one that I can't figure out. <laughs> I keep, you know what? I keep forgetting. There's an actual lag between what you're able to see and what's showing up on my um my PowerPoint. So, oh yeah, well I've seen this one too. I saw the uh, the uh, I took a, it was physics 114 planetary science and uh, his his syllabus has been very similar to yours so far. We started with Earth and then went to the Moon and then went to the Sun uh, and then planets and then kind of blew up into the the uh, galaxy universe you know obvious progression, but um, like I say, we talked about the different types of stars and their, and their, uh, how they vary in intensity and density and size. Perfect. 
Well, it sounds like you got you pretty much got the gist of, of today's talk. So, guys, Joe has kind of given you everything we're going to be talking Better about. Better bring some 104 <laughs> stuff at me, homie. <laughs> oh, man. So, by any chance, do you remember what the name of this particular plot or diagram is called? Uh, no, but I know there's uh, there's several classes listed across the bottom there. The OBAFGKM are all star classes, and then uh, the Y value is the uh, uh, is it intensity or, or uh, luminosity? Luminosity. Okay, so yeah, so the brightness and and uh, density, I guess, the combination of those two things, probably. Oh, I think Larry. A lot, a lot of people here are already like answering. So Larry, I think. Well, according to my view of the chat, it looks like Larry already has it. It's called the HR diagram. Um, and our intro. Thank you for putting the name there because I always get the H part me messed up. Hertzsprung and Russell diagram. And so basically. What we're looking at here, and I mean, we're going to spend a little bit of time on this plot because there's actually a, a ton of information embedded within this plot. Um, but mainly, what we're looking at here on this plot is the diagonal line of stars that runs from the upper left-hand corner to roughly the lower right-hand corner. And that line of stars is known as the main sequence. So... I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep test, testing your, your your knowledge of of of, of, of stars here, Joe. If you don't mind. Okay. I don't mind. That's what we're here for. So. It's quiz day. What must be the primary condition for a star for it to be on the main sequence? And actually, chat. If you guys can answer, if you know the answer, by all means, go ahead and type it in. Oh man, I I again, I don't I don't ha I don't recall specifics there. I just know. That uh, everything off the main sequence are just like these oddity outliers uh, that are uncommon, uh, but that that linear uh, progression of size and intensity um, is somehow important too. But I don't remember the details. I think I think Tom hit it. Tom hit it. That's it, Tom. So all the main sequence stars are fusing hydrogen within their core. That's the primary. That's the main condition. To, be, to become a member of the main sequence. And the interesting thing about this is that a star will spend most of its lifetime, I think it's almost like 90% of its lifetime, on this main sequence before it begins to move off into, um, and become other types of stars. Some of those types of stars we see here on the, on the um, HR diagram being the giants, which are kind of located in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and then a really, like, final stage of evolution for certain types of stars is at the lower left hand corner of our HR diagram and those are the white dwarfs. So our intro it's our intro um, notes it's cool it's cooler to hotter going from right to left along the x-axis and it is dimmer to brighter um, in luminosity going um, along the y-axis. So thank you our intro that's perfect. You guys, see you guys already know this information Um, so I, I believe if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, um, and also I should note, guys, all the images that are being shown here, of course, I have not generated. I don't want to take any credit for them. Um, if I can remember who produced the image, I will definitely provide that information. But for this particular image, I believe I got it from Wiki. Most of my stuff I'm, I, I try to get is from Wiki if I can. <laughs> Cold fusion at play. Uh. Oh no 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 no! <laughs> the um the I'm assuming you might be talking about the fusion happening within the in, the internal cores of the um of these main sequence stars. No, it's definitely it's definitely extremely hot. Um, thermonuclear fusion. So, as I was stating earlier, these particular stars are um are fusing hydrogen and they're fusing the hydrogen into helium. Um. So yeah, definitely high pressures, high temperatures occurring within the internal um, structure of, of, of stars. And so, there's, there's another key thing um, that was mentioned, I believe you mentioned it here earlier, in fact, yeah, you did mention it earlier, Joe, about um, a relationship that's kind of embedded 
within this plot. Of course, whenever you look at a plot, I mean, you can look at the trends and you can see all the trends, but there's actually a, a um, some sort of mathematical formula that kind of defines what that trend is. And so in the case of this plot, the mathematical formula that, that one would use is known as the Stefan Boltzmann's Law, which relates the um, y-axis luminosity to the um, to the, the essentially the temperature axis, um, which is the x-axis, and the key the key relationship between those two things is that you can also throw in the size, the physical size of the uh, of the star, and you get a nice relationship between these three quantities. Um, I'm going to stay away from math unless you guys want me to. I, I know I have a PDF somewhere on my computer that kind of breaks it down further, but we're going to stay away from the math. If you ever, if you want to learn more about this relationship, you can always go to Wiki and type in Steph. Well, go to Google and type in Stefan Boltzmann's law for stars, and I'm pretty sure it'll lead you to a, a good link for explaining that. But yeah, as Joe stated earlier, as you basically move from lower or as Joe and I believe another another member of the audience stated earlier, um, our intro I believe, as you move from the lower right hand corner to the upper left hand corner, essentially what's happening is one, the stars are getting along the main sequence that is, the um, stars are getting brighter, they're getting bigger, and they're getting hotter. Um, and that's pretty much all I want to say for now with the HR diagram. Um, the plan is eventually for our later streams to go ahead and move away from the HR or the main the main sequence of the HR diagram and talk more about um, the stellar evolution of these um, stars and how they evolve into what we see into into the other types of stars we see in the HR diagram. That is the, the giants and the um, and the white dwarfs, as well as some other types of stars that aren't present on this particular diagram. All right, so I kind of figured it'd be nice, of course, since we're talking about these stars, to kind of start on the work our way from the inside out. And so we're going to go to the core of the star. And as mentioned earlier, within the core of um of these stars, we have hydrogen fusing into um helium. Now, depending on the mass of the star, we can get. A, we can get different um, fusing uh, fusion processes, and so um, I, I, so quick question, Joe. I, I don't know if your if your screen's updated, but can you see the current slide that shows um, basically two yeah, images? Yeah, protons colliding. Yeah. Ah, that's it. Protons colliding, almost kind of like billiard balls, right? Yeah. So, so have you heard of we the proton? About, we just talked about this stuff at the end of. Uh, this last semester of chemistry, I just took, we talked about uh, uh, radioactivity and, and how these things smash together and uh, spit off gamma rays or all kinds. Of, there were four different types of. Uh, I'm, I'm losing my word. No, you're good. I, I think you're. I think you're talking about um, fission, nuclear fission. So um, there's um, three different types. Of, well, not nuclear fission, but radioactive decay. Excuse me. There's three different types yeah, yeah. of radioactive decay. There's alpha, beta, alpha radiation, beta, and gamma. Um, but in this case, we're not we're not talking about radioactive decay. We're more yeah, so talking. Yeah, coming apart. We're smashing together. Yeah, we're, sma we're smashing together here. So we're actually going to be fusing um, these particles together, these hydrogen particles, to produce helium. Um, and depending on the mass of the star. Um, you can get one of two of these particular types of of um, interactions. That is, the proton-proton chain being one type of interaction to produce um, to go from hydrogen to helium, and the CNO cycle being the other. Now, me personally, I like to be able to see things in motion, and so I'm going to go ahead and start with um, this little animation for the proton-proton chain. And what's essentially happening here is we have two protons coming together, or hydrogen um, nuclei smashing into each other, making a deuterium atom here. Um, deuterium being a proton and a neutron. Another proton comes along. This makes now a helium-3 um, helium um, atom or nuclei. That helium-3 um, nuclei interacts 
with another helium-3 nuclei. And finally, you get the, um, the helium-4 um, nuclei as, as a result of, that, of, of all those interactions. Um, there's, of course, other particles being produced here. But I'm trying to keep up with just the key particles here. Of course, you see some fo you see a photon there, and I thought and I think earlier there was a positron that was emitted. But also the chemical equation um, is also is, is also indicated at the bottom of the screen. And so this this particular type of interaction um, between the um, hydrogen nuclei to produce the helium nuclei is fairly simple. However, if we move over to the right to the CNO cycle. <laughs> the um, the actual interactions that are occurring to produce the helium are actually far more um, complex, and the reason being is because you now you you now not only have hydrogen um, interacting to produce the helium, but you have these other three key um, elements to help produce the helium. That is the um, the carbon, which which the CNO actually is an, is a abbreviation or yeah, is abbreviation for the C stands for carbon, the N stands for nitrogen, and the O stands for oxygen. And so, along with the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, the hydrogen is able to to um, go through a series of interactions to produce um, the helium, the helium four um, nuclei. Now, the key thing I want to mention here is that the reason why there's these two different types of um, methods of being able to produce helium from hydrogen is primarily due to the internal structures of the stars. And so what you'll end up finding is that, and, and I'm going to quickly take a quick moment. So for a star like our sun, Joe, which type of I interaction do you think is going to be at play to convert the hydrogen to helium? The proton-proton chain or the CNO cycle? Uh, well, since I'm hoping that there's not a ton of carbon and nitrogen in our sun yet, I think it's probably a proton-proton chain. That is a good deduction there. So, um, Joe is exactly right. So the proton-proton chain is, um, is the primary means of converting hydrogen and helium within the, within the core of our, of our sun. In fact, it's probably the primary means of converting hydrogen to helium in stars that are uh, in stars that have a mass of roughly, I think, 1.5 times the the mass of the sun and below. However, as you begin to much as you begin to get to much higher mass stars, the CNO cycle becomes the the the, the primary means of converting hydrogen to helium. Now, I know I've just been talking, and I, I don't want to miss any of the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Trilithium. Trilithium. Um, are you talk? Are you talking about um, tritium? I think it's called tritium, which is um uh, a isotope of hydrogen. So, Hanny states stars are fusion. Right? Yes, stars are fusion. Are there any natural instances of fission? So, natural instances of fission. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, you get the process of fission when you collide things together, and well, you collide one, let's say, species into another species, and the net result is that you get a lower mass. Um, product and so natural sources of fission um I don't know I know that we I know that we we can produce we, we have fission we can do fission but a natural source of fission is not coming to mind I'm pretty sure there might be though let me just think about it for a minute I'm just trying to quickly look at the comments here Um, so Michael T. Mayer says, surely white dwarfs started off on the main sequence. Yet the progenitor stars for white dwarfs were on the main sequence. They were main sequence stars. And eventually the, those particular main sequence stars, they evolve off the main sequence, um, go into a, a giant phase and eventually end up becoming, becoming white dwarfs. But we're definitely going to get back to that in one of the future streams. 
All right. So, now that we've talked about the way in which um, stars are able to produce their energy, we can now move on from the from the internal core um, of, of the star and kind of look to see what's going on on the outside of that. And so, I was able to find this nice um this nice um, diagram online that kind of shows what the internal structure of stars looks like, main sequence stars in particular. And so moving from the left hand side to the right hand side, we're kind of getting into um, these different types of stars. The very first um, the very first image on the left hand side of our, of our diagram here is an O-type, it was an imp is a depiction of an O-type star. Um, O-type stars having masses somewhere around 60 solar masses. And what we kind of see here it's kind of, um, for the interior that is, everything that's beneath the photosphere. Um, we're kind of seeing a, a radiative zone, then underneath the radiative zone, we have our convective zone, and then finally we have our core. However, as you begin to move to much lower mass stars, especially stars that are kind of like, sim have, have similar mass to our sun, we kind of get this kind of flip between the radiative zone and the convective zone. And then lastly, as we move to the to the, ver the lowest mass main sequence stars, we kind of get a situation where we don't have any radiative zone at all. Now, all of this is due to the fact this is due to how it's all of this is due to how the energy being generated within the core can easily propagate to the outer layers of, of the star. It just so happens that um that for higher mass stars, um I'm trying to, I can't remember the exact mass at which we kind of get this flip from a solar type internal structure to um, the high mass star type um, internal structure but it really has a lot to do with um, with the, the most convenient for lack of better words the most convenient way or, or the easiest way for energy to be able to be transported from the core to the outer layers of, of, of the star and it just so happened with, with with stars that are extremely low in mass, um, that are almost a tenth of, a tenth of, of a solar mass. Being able to transfer energy by means of radiation is just is just not a is just not a method that's um a preferred a preferred method for these particular type of stars. Oh, wait a second. Hold on. It looks like someone says, I think, so Michael T. Mayer says, I think I am confused by the name main sequence because it sounds as though it should be a progression. However, I think it is just a form of nomenclature. So, I, I think, I think it's, I think it's primarily due to, due to um, how these stars show up on, show up on the HR diagram. I don't ex exactly know who termed the name main sequence for these stars. But if you look at the HR diagram, so I'm just gonna go back two slides here. If you look at the HR diagram though, I mean, there's this, this like you said, there's a sequence of stars though, along the um, along the diagonal, the, the left to right diagonal of this plot. Um, and of course, Yeah, I, I honestly don't know, to be very honest, who came up with the name main sequence. But I should really try to find out why it's why it's called the main sequence. So just taking a moment here to kind of look at some of the comments I may have missed. So Larry states that some geologists speculate that fission is happening at the core of the Earth. That's interesting. So Michael, Michael, it sounds like it sounds like you're. So are you, are you making a, a relationship between the name main sequence and then the evolution of of, of stars? Yeah. 
So, Hanny, so are, are, are the elements in the stars evenly distributed? Um, that is a very good question. I think... So the composition of, 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 of most of the... The composition of main sequence stars is primarily that most of most of the uh, mass is, is is hydrogen. I think initially when the starts when when the stars start off, it's probably somewhere around ninety percent hydrogen. Um, then somewhere close to probably like ten percent helium, and then the rest are like trace are, are higher mass um, trace elements of of of, of higher masses. Um, An even distribution. I think that the core is primarily I honestly don't know if it's even distribution. I my 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 mind is just such that most of it is is high is, is hydrogen anyway. And as far as the core is concerned as far as the core is concerned, you'd simply just have hydrogen being converted into helium. So actually, no. I I I I think I'm I think I'm gonna go with that. It's not evenly distributed. Evenly distributed. So how do things other than hydrogen ever burn? So eventually, once the um once the main sequence star star stops burning hydrogen within its core, um, depending on its mass, it can it can begin to start fusing fusing um higher elements or start fusing helium into higher elements such as like carbon and then continue all the way up into fusing to fusing iron depending on the initial mass of the star um, or depending on the mass of, of the main sequence star well we're definitely going to come back to this in one of our future streams All right, guys. So I'm going to go ahead and move along to our next slide here. And you know what, Joe? I feel like I'm leaving you out of the conversation. I'm so sorry. So um, I'm uh, interacting with chat too. I'm, I'm having a I'm, it's, it's a party over here, man. I'm living the life in my own comfortable <laughs> chair, hanging out with a bunch of nerds doing science, man. They're That's right. Me, yeah. I'll let you know if I get bored. I <laughs> All right, so now what we're going to move on to is um, well, this plot that we see that we see here in front of us. So this these this particular plot is showing what's known as black body curves. So the light that's being produced um, at the center of the star, of course, it, it, it comes out of the core and moves up through the um, radiative and convective zones and eventually it's able to escape through the atmosphere of, of, of the star so and what I mean by the atmosphere is pretty much everything that's at the photospheric level and above so I don't know if you guys can remember the diagram I showed for um, the structure of, of the Sun of a few streams ago but basically the atmosphere of the Sun is composed of at, at, at the most outer layer would be the corona and then moving inward, you'd have the transition zone, then the chromosphere, and then finally you'd hit the um, the photosphere. And so those particular four layers make up the atmosphere, essentially make up the atmosphere of, of a star. And so as the light escapes the as the light is escaping the um, of, escaping the inner inner portions of a star. And, and now propagating up through the atmosphere. What essentially you'll see, or what the type of light you'll get, will, um, will produce the type of curve that we're seeing here, these black body radiation curves. And the key thing that I want to note here is that these particular curves, or the light, the, the light that's, being, that's used to generate these curves, um, have some very useful relationships with being able to determine one key property of, of a star, namely its temperature. And so what you'll end up seeing is, 
Of course, for cool for cooler stars, their black body curves will be relatively small. And as you begin to get to um, hotter stars, or another way of thinking of, thinking of it, as as you begin to get to more massive main sequence stars, their black body curves will be, will, um, be much higher. But not just that, though. You'll also see a general shift in the peak um, of, of the curve. As you can tell here, as we move from 3, 000, uh, a 3,000 Kelvin curve, which is represented by the red curve, to a 5,000 Kelvin curve, which is represented by the blue curve, you can kind of see there's going to be a shift in the in the wavelength of, of the peak of, of the curves. Um, the peak for the 3,000 Kelvin curve is kind of towards one micrometer, whereas the peak for the 5,000 K um, curve kind of moves towards much shorter wavelengths. And so all this information is um is is is, is key in being able to kind of distinguish between um between the stars. Main sequence stars that is. And so moving on Moving on, so I, I was able to go online and find uh, a plot that basically showed um, the black body spectrum for a star that's that, that's, that's similar to our sun, um, where at the photospheric level it has a temperature of. Oh yeah, that's one thing I should be mentioning here. Um, these temperatures that you're able to extract from these black body curves are basically indicate what the temperature is at the photospheric level of the star. So what I'm showing here is the black body spectrum. Um, well, the actual black body spectrum um, for our sun and the um, black body spectrum we get from from the analytical um, formula that produces um, these, these um, curves. So the analytical um, formula produces the gray shaded region Whereas the essentially, I would say yellow, um, yellow, re the yellow curve um, corresponds to, as stated here, extraterrestrial extraterrestrial solar spectral irradiance. Or another way of saying this is that um, we've acquired the spectrum of the sun um, outside of our atmosphere. Um, of course, it's going to look a little bit different, um, and that's that has a lot to do with how light is absorbed and emitted by various gases that it passes through. So in this situation, what's happening to make it clear, we have the inter we have the inside of our sun generating light. That light moves through the radiative or radiative and convective zone. It escapes through the photos the photosphere, but now it enters the atmosphere of, of, of a star. Um the atmosphere being the photosphere, the the um, chromosphere, the transition zone, and the corona. There are certain elements within the um, within the atmosphere that have the ability to to um, absorb and, and, and emit light coming from um, the, the core of the star. And so, the reason why I bring this up is because if stars did not have an atmosphere, what we'd expect to see is a very smooth. Um, a very smooth back black body curve. In other words, I'm kind of I'm going to see if I can zoom in here. Let's see what this looks like on the OBS screen. Okay, I need to move over just a little bit more. All right. And so what we'd expect is for if there was if stars didn't have an atmosphere, what we'd expect is for the um we expect for we expect to basically see a smooth curve uh, for the black body spectrum that's observed. Excuse me. However, what we kind of see here is actually all of these like dips and spikes at the outer at the outermost um, portions of, of the of the curve. And these dips and spikes that we're kind of that we're seeing here are due to absorption and emissions of of, of 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 light from various gases within the atmosphere of the star. In this case, the sun. And the reason why I bring this up is because this allows us another way of of being able to of being able to um, distinguish different types of stars. So I'm gonna move on, here and I need to zoom back out now. 
Let's see if this gets everything back to normal. All right, there we go. And so, what we're looking at here are different spectrums for different types of different types of stars. So, of course, earlier on, and even Joe mentioned this, um, the the stars are classified um, based off of a lettering system. Um, the lettering system being oh oh well I, I can never remember just the, the the plain letters, even though I can look at it here along the um, what what appears to be like a y axis there, but O B A F G K M. Now when I was learning about um, in grad school when I was learning about um different types of stars or different types of main sequence stars, we kind of you know you, it was a mnemonic device to be able to remember the different spectral types. And the one that I ended up learning was OBA, fine, girl or guy, kiss me. And so, and that helps you just generally remember um, the different types of, of spectral types. However, each spectral type has a sub spectral type. Um, and you can kind of see that here. If you look along the, um, along what, what, what would be a y axis for this um, diagram. You, or, or for this plot, which you which you'd see basically is that for the B type, um, for the B spectral type, you see this B two and this B five. Um, of course, everything here is related to the temperature of the star. So I, I don't want I don't want you guys I don't want you guys to get the idea that that the composition of the stars is 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 different because in reality the composition of the stars are for the most part the same. Really, the differences are, are due to the temperatures, um, the temperatures of the stars at the photospheric level. Where, if you're an O-type star, at the photospheric level, your temperature is relatively high, compared to if you're an M-type star, your your temperature at the photo photospheric level is extremely low. Um, and yeah, but basically, if you want to be able to, if you're looking at a star and you're able to get a spectrum. Of uh, its of it of the light coming from this of the star, especially here, like in the, in the um, what would be the visible wavelength range of the electromagnetic spectrum, you'd kind of see these these lines, and you can use those spectral lines to determine the type of star you're looking at. And so, for the most part, that's really where I wanted to leave off with today. Um, as far as as far, as far as main sequence stars, so we can just now just go ahead and you know just talk with each other about main sequence stars. So all stars are made of hydrogen, helium, helium, and metal. Yes. So for astronomers, yeah, exactly. Everything that has a mass higher than helium is a metal. So the sun's fingerprint in this situation is not shown exactly. So the sun is a, is a G2 type star, and the 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 spectrums that I'm or the spectra that I show here do not show the spectra for a, for a G a G2 type star. It does show it for a G0 and a G5 type. But yes, essentially, the um, if there was a G2 spectrum here, then yeah, that would be the fingerprint for for our star. And them. Oh, thanks, our intro. So, <laughs> as soon as they start fusing carbon, it's over. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, if if a, if a star is in the process of fusing carbon in its core, it's no longer a main sequence star. It's in the process of of what we'd call dying. <laughs> it's going through the stellar death process.
Hey hip, hey hipsicular, or hipsicular raptor. <laughs> but yeah, um, I was thinking that there was reason to. So I'm gonna quickly just go back and see what, what comments I missed from earlier. Now one thing that I do want to mention though is um color. Color of stars. So now if you're physically looking at a star the star's color can give you a, a sense of what type of star it is as well. Um, I'm trying to remember what the what the what the colors are. I think if you're like an like an O, a B, and an eighth, an O and a B type star, you will look bluish. If you're looking, if you're physically looking at the star in the night sky with your naked eye, um, if you're looking at an A type star. I think it's maybe an A and F. I think you're going to be like, or A type star. You might be blue, blue, white, blue or white. I think I think as you move to F and G type stars, you'll look um, white or yellow. Um, but yeah, I, I'm. I, I it's it's been a while since I've actually went out and like looked up at the stars and. With the with a telescope, you can do this with a telescope as well, though. But also, the color indicates can indicate temperature as well. Or better yet, the color does indicate temperature. So Joe, did I miss anything? Any any like really good questions? Uh, no, not the, I I missed a lot too because when I was trying to see some details on the chart, I would hit the little arrow to kind of like minimize chat. Turns out when you do that, it doesn't collect chat anymore. When you open it back up, it kind of starts over. Oh. So I may have missed something, but uh, I don't think so. So yeah, I'm trying to quickly just go to the very top and just see what I'm missing, what I may have missed here. Okay, so really quickly, Hanny asks, is the atmosphere of the sun the clear part or does it look like the surface? So typically, whenever we're looking at, 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 at the sun, we're looking at the photospheric level of the sun. And so everything above the photosphere would, would, would constitute the, um, or the photosphere and above would constitute the, the atmosphere of the star. I think I'm caught up to that point. Let's see. Um, I give is the non main sequence stars are primarily end of life. So, one thing I should also mention here, guys, is that. The lifetimes of main sequence stars varies depending on the star's mass. Um, higher mass main sequence stars will die off much, much more faster 
relative to lower mass main sequence stars. And the reason being is because they burn through their through their, their fuel, their fuel being hydrogen much faster. And we know this do we can know this based off of the um the relationship between and I've done this calculation before actually. But basically um if you want to be able to determine how long a uh, main sequence like or determine the lifetime for a main sequence star you can basically use the equation um that the total amount of energy that it can that it can convert is going to be that is convert hydrogen to helium is going to be equal to the um, luminosity of the star which is the energy output um, of the star divided by or times um, its lifetime and then of course you just you modify that equation to solve for the lifetime of the star And I, I think I think in one of my past streams I actually I actually covered the lifetime of a star. Um, yeah, I did I believe. So is a is a very hot star that shines in the ultraviolet violet dim. So, uh, a, a star, a star that, a star that shines. So, so let's actually go back to this plot. So, a star that shines, um, a star that has a peak in the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum, it will have, it will, it will, it will more than likely have a lot more. Well, it will have, it will have a lot more radiation in the visible portion of the spectrum relative to a star that peaks in the infrared portion of the, of the spectrum. If you notice, um, so once you get past visible, so as you go to longer wavelengths, um, for example, this 3000 Kelvin black body curve that's represented by red, um, that would represent a star that has a peak in the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And if you notice, the amount of light that's generating and the visible portion of the spectrum is much lower compared to for in this for in this example um, I'm going to use the um, the blue curve which corresponds to a much hotter star that in this case peaks in the visible but has a lot more radiation well a star that peaks in the UV will even have even more radiation being generated in the visible portion of the spectrum So the so, so to answer your question there, Hanny, um, a very hot sh star would be very bright in the um, visible portion of the spectrum. Uh, a star that that peaks in the infrared or has most of its light in the infrared will be very dim in the um, visible portion of the spectrum. Can we help you with your physics homework? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I I don't think I can. I can I can do this. You can ask me a question, and then I'll ask you a question, and then you go. Of course, have to go off and figure out the answer to my question, which should probably help you with your question. But I I can't just outright just do your do the work for you. But yeah, I I don't mind helping. As long as it's homework and you you have the right to be helped with, you know, with that particular assignment. I can't remember the name of that method where you basically ask the person a bunch of questions and it kind of helps them lead their thought process to the answer. That's exactly what I would do with you. Okay, someone someone here needs to be a uh, someone here who's a biologist. Help us with this question that Hanny's posed here. Um, see, I think he said something about plants being green. 
I thought that was because of like, what is that name of that substance? Chlorophyll inside the plants, which is what causes them to be green. So Hanny's asked another good question here. If the center is millions of degrees. Oh, wait a second. Can you guys hear me? My sound just like kind of dropped out here. Joe, can you hear me? You're muted, Joe. Yeah, I know. I, you can I hear me? Coughing. Okay. Yeah. All right. So if you can hear me, I'm just going to assume everyone else can hear me as well. I was kind of worried there. All right. But yeah, if, if the center if the center um, is millions of degrees, how does the surface get so cool? Um, I think it's because of the fact that the energy is gonna the energy that's being generated within the core of the sun is now spreading out over a larger surface area. Or better yet, no 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 no. Wait a second. Hold on. Ido gas law. I think is is most is most applicable here. Oh, someone already answered the question there. DPI, plants are green because of chlorophyll. So, Michael T. Mayer, I wrote an essay about how stars go supernova. Yeah, um, they're actually... All right, so here's a question for you, Michael. Or actually to the, to, the, to the chat. So, they're actually different type of supernova, right? Um, and my question to the chat is, what, what's the name of the type of supernova that high-mass main-sequence stars go through? I'm going to quickly zoom down to the bottom here. It's type 2 is correct. So yeah, the high mass main sequence stars, um, they of course, um, they die. They leave the main sequence, they go into their giant phase, and eventually they explode, and the explosion they undergo is, is a type 2 supernova. And so the one, the 1A one is, um, the 1A supernova is for, is the production of, um, no, it's when a white dwarf explodes. So when a white dwarf accumulates mass, um, through accreting material from a, from a, from a neighbor, um, it will undergo a supernova type 1A explosion if the mass of the of the white dwarf becomes 1.4 solar masses so does it does a cme cool the sun a bit um let's let's think about that well 
As far as the surface temperature is concerned, for the most part, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that it, it doesn't really cool it even a bit. Mass is ejected, but not a considerable amount of mass to the point where it, it will cause any, any um, changes in temperature. So how much is a small bit, though, our intro? Yes, yeah, sunspots on, on the surface of, 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 of a star are cooler than the surrounding region. But in general, though, the surface of, of a star is, is more or less at a constant temperature. Um, so, Larry, that's a very good question. Why are sunspots cooler? I used to know this answer. Just give me a second. Let me... So sunspots are region, or, or, or stellar spots or sunspots, are regions on a, um, on a star surface that exhibit, that are regions of, 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 of magnetic activity. Um, Right now, the the reason is the why they're cooler is just is, is leaving me. It's it's not there right now. <laughs> if it comes to me, then I'm definitely gonna share. So so Michael states here aren't sunspot holes in the surface, so you see the cooler. Well, no, the thing about it is that. Um, the temperature of a star, the temperature of a star, it's it it, it decreases going from the um, from the core out. So as you go into a star, it's actually hotter. I heard that the upper atmosphere of the sun, yes. So as you move beyond the photosphere to higher um, regions in the atmosphere, um, it does get hotter. And this is primarily due to magnetic, magnetic activity occurring within the atmosphere of the star. Man, guys, I am so loving this this conversation. Honestly, I don't get enough chances to actually think about these things a lot. Yeah, our intro has a very good point. Um, wait, the particles in that part of the solar corona, right? The density falls off, right, as you go to to higher layers of the of the of a star. Yes, it is DPI. I couldn't agree with you more. Oh, I'm sure I'm sure Joe loves you guys. We love these conversations. Oh, 
Oh, that's right. He did tell me. He told me. <laughs> oh, okay. That's good. The repair bill is only $124. That's good. Yeah, I was, I was, me and, me and Joe were having a conversation earlier before the stream. Um, so during graduate school, my car had many problems and I didn't have the money, of course, to be able to pay for those problems. So instead of paying a mechanic to fix the problem, I just basically went and got tools and started doing research and learned how to fix my own car. <laughs> tools cost more than mechanics. But tools are a good investment, though. That's true. That's true. Only the first, the first mechanic. They're free after that. Right? <laughs> exactly. Man, you guys are got, you guys are about to get me talking about my car now. But we're gonna keep it about science here. <laughs> that's a good point. Bicycles come in at a one fifty. I, I would have I would have um used the bicycle to commute back and forth between between my apartment and and my graduate school. It's just that I lived much farther away because it was cheaper farther away from the school. I couldn't agree with you more, DPI, you're right. I felt so stupid when I was trying to Susie could not be more correct. Scientists need good mechanics and engineers too. Well guys, it's about 138 now. And I'm pretty well. I don't know if this is the case, but Susie, will um, astronomy cast be occurring like 20 minutes from now? <laughs> Bikes have poor AC. Yes, you're right. And I remember, I remember a friend of mine in graduate school ended up getting. He was riding to um, he was riding into school, and a car ended up like clipping him, and he had like this like really long rip in his arm. It was horrible okay so yeah astronomy cast should be beginning in 20 minutes so guys i love today's stream you guys were great I had a really good conversation about about main sequence stars Ooh, dwarf galaxies so i'm assuming that's what the astronomy cast is going to be about dwarf galaxies No, Peter, thank you for coming. Guys, thank you all for showing up. It was a great conversation. And me and Joe will be back next week, Wednesday, after Daily Space, which will begin yeah, at 12 o'clock. Have a good weekend, guys. What's that? I was telling everybody to have a good weekend. Yes, guys, have a good weekend. And like I was saying, we'll be back after Daily Space next Wednesday, which should start at 12 o'clock p.m. Central, which is 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern. <laughs> All right, guys. Bye.